You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 470. I think people who have faults are a lot more interesting than people who are perfect. Spike Lee. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, how to turn your independent film into a profitable business. It's harder today than ever before for independent filmmakers to make money with their films, from predatory film distributors ripping them off to huckster film aggregators who prey upon them. The odds are stacked against the indie filmmaker. The old distribution model of making money with your film is broken and there needs to be a change. The future of independent filmmaking is the entrepreneurial filmmaker or the film entrepreneur. In Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, I break down how to actually make money with your film projects and show you how to turn your indie film into a profitable business. With case studies examining successes and failures, this book shows you the step-by-step method to turn your passion into a profitable career. If you're making a feature film, series, or any other kind of video content, the Film Entrepreneur method will set you up for success. The book is available in paperback, ebook, and of course, audiobook. If you want to order it, just head over to www.filmbizbook.com. That's film, B-I-Z, book.com. And today's show is also sponsored by the Heart Chart Screenwriting Masterclass taught by legendary screenwriter James V. Hart, the writer of Bram Stoker's Dracula, Hook, and Contact, to name a few. His unique story mapping system will teach you how to get your script ready for production and the marketplace. To gain instant access, head over to bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash heart chart. That's H-A-R-T chart. Well, guys, today on the show, we have a pair of filmmakers who have done something that is almost impossible to do. And that's why I wanted to kind of talk to them and see how they did it. We have on the show today, James Lafferty and Stephen Coletti. And they are both actor, producers, and directors of the new Hulu show, Everything is Doing Great. Now, James and Steven did something that really hasn't been done before, which they actually shot an entire series first and then went and sold that series completely done to a major streamer. That's generally not the way it works. Generally, you would do a pilot Maybe, or you would pitch them the show and then they would pay for it and and do it that way. But for whatever reason, they were able, I guess the timing and the product and everything, they were able to do the impossible and had Hulu purchase their show already produced. So they had complete creative control and they just did what they wanted to do. And they did it all on a shoestring budget, basically by crowdfunding and raising some capital in the private sector, which uh, again, not a lot of money to do what they did. They really did this on an indie film style budget. So I really cannot wait to share with you all their secrets and how they did all this. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with James Lafferty and Stephen Coletti. I'd like to welcome to the show James Lafferty and Stephen Coletti. How are you guys doing? Fantastic. Thanks for having doing us. Well, man. Thanks yeah. for having us. Oh, thank you for for being on the show, man. I heard um we have we have some friends in common, Ian and Esh Nelms, uh, who were on my show a while ago promoting or we're talking about their whole career, but at the time promoting Fat Man, which is obviously one of the best Christmas movies ever made. Um, <laughs> but uh, and, and, and my audience was going crazy for that episode because it is just just hilarious. If anyone listening has not listened to it, go find that episode on the back catalog because um, the boys were great. And then they reached out to me. They're like, hey, I got these guys who did this insane thing, were part of this project, and they, they pitched it to me. And I was like, well, I've never heard of that before. How the hell did these guys shoot an independent series that got picked up by a major streamer? 
Like I know they picked up indie films because my film was picked up. My first film was picked up by them for, you know, license for a year um, back when they were doing that kind of stuff. But a show is unheard of. So um, we're going to get into the weeds about how you guys did that because I'm fascinated. I truly, really want to know how the hell that happened. Um, but before we get into it, uh, how did each of you get into the business? We'll start with you, Jimmy. Yeah, so um, I started really young. Um, I started uh, doing extra work actually when I was about six years old. My uh, my mom would bring my brother and I in from Riverside County to LA just to get onto sets, um, just to sort of expand our world a little bit. Um, we didn't really know, you know, at a young age what we wanted to be. Um, you know, obviously we didn't, you know, we weren't like theater kids or stage kids or anything like that. Um, it was really just for our mom to, you know, uh, help us understand that the world was bigger than that small town that we came from. And um, we just fell in love with it, of course. I mean, you can't really take a kid to a, a film set and play around with other kids and get to experience that atmosphere and have them not catch the bug. Hmm. And sure enough, we did. Um, and so from uh, from about 10 years old on, I started auditioning. And um, from there, it was just like a steady progression of, you know, booking my first Mervyn's commercial at uh, 12 to, uh, <laughs> you know, getting a guest spot on, um, uh, you know, picket fences or something like that. And then... Um, uh, you know, just continuing on from there um, to reoccurring roles. And um, I basically, uh, yeah, I, by the time I was a senior in high school, I had um, booked um, this little uh, uh, WB teen drama called One Tree Hill, um, which ended up becoming um, sort, sort of a hit, I guess. Um, it at least ran for a very long time um, until about uh, 2011. Um, and, uh, yeah, that sort of takes, that takes us up to, to, you know, I guess when I was an adult, right. You know, that's, that's <laughs> sort of how it was my way in really. Right. How about you, Steven? Yeah, I was a little more unconventional. I, I, um, I kind of first started working in the business in about 2004, uh, working with MTV. Uh, I started out doing a reality show with them, completely victim of circumstance out of nowhere did this, uh, show land in my community and, and drop my lap. Um, but I was interested in in, um, in hosting and wanted to get in, in entertainment. And so, in fact, one thing I want to do was was to be a VJ. Um, you know, watching Carson Daly growing up and um, doing that gig, I thought that, that was a pretty cool thing and, and wanted to pursue that. So I looked at MTV as like, well, all right, uh, I feel like these people can get me in over there. <laughs> so I um, wound up doing this show called Laguna Beach uh, for a season, two seasons, Um and then uh, I started hosting for MTV. Um, and then um, I did a little bit of acting growing up, it, you know, just just in school and stuff and enjoyed it. Um, but I uh, didn't think it was gonna be something I'd take seriously. And and the more I kind of got into hosting, wasn't so excited about it, found acting interesting, wanted to study it and, and did. And so as I was um, hosting for MTV, I, you know, was um, working on on acting and, and studying and, and from there, um, I booked um, my first film, something called. It was actually it wound up being Havoc Two. It wasn't that. It wasn't. It wasn't <laughs> supposed to be the sequel originally, um, but that's what uh, Who Took a New Line? I think it was. That's why they wound up selling it as um, called Normal Adolescent Behavior. And uh, in that film, uh, actually worked with a girl um, named Hillary Burton who worked on One Tree Hill. And um, I went about auditioning for One Tree Hill and getting a part there, and then. Um, it was kind of set on, on working on the show with James for about five or six years. So you guys, so you guys are coming at this whole thing very unconventionally because you're coming from the acting side. So you guys were on a, on a hit show for, for a good amount of time. Um, you've been on, obviously you guys have been on sets a lot throughout your careers, uh, up to this point. And then what, what made you guys get together and say, you know, we're going to take the power in our own hands and build our own content and try to sell that own. So you essentially stop asking permission to do what you love to do and start creating those opportunities for yourselves. Very, very Ben and, and Matt, uh, Goodwill hunting style, um, in that way. So what, what made you as actors decide to like, you know, is there something that caused you to do it or is there something that you tickled your fancy or did you just like, you know what, we, you really need to kind of get our own stuff going. Yeah, I think it was a mixture of things, um, as it always is, I guess, you know, it's, it's, it has a little something to do with, um, you know, coming off of a, um, uh, a TV show and thinking things are going to be easy and it actually not being that easy. It's, you right. know, getting to a certain point in, in your life as an actor, or I guess as a professional in this business where you realize that things are cyclical, like you're going to have 
you're going to have times that are, you know, really good for a while. You're going to have a great cycle and then you're going to have a really dry cycle and then you're going to, it's going to come back. It's a sort of pendulum swing situation. And you start to realize that. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And uh, I, I guess around for us, it was around that 25, 26, 27 age when One Tree Hill was ending, right? Um, but then also, you know, I don't think you can be on a show for that long um, and not learn something. I mean, you really have to not be. Uh, you have to be pretty dense. You have to be pretty dense not, at that yeah, point. Yeah, sink in. <laughs> and I think, um, you know, we we were always paying very close attention because we always knew that behind the camera was where we would want to be eventually. We just, we knew that we would want to tell stories. Um, you know, for me, a big part of it was being able to step behind the camera and direct on One Tree Hill. Um, and then I know, you know, Stephen can speak to, you know, the fact that he was producing coming out of One Tree Hill and stuff. But, um, you know, that's that's sort of where I was coming from is like, I know I want to tell stories, um, but, you know, and I know I have, I'm going to want to write, right? So I'm writing scripts and these scripts are like high concept and very expensive. Um, and this is obviously, as you know, and your audience will know, these, these ideas are very hard to get made. <laughs> um, so at a certain point for me, it was like, okay, what can I make um, that can uh, be made, you know, what can, what can we make that, that, that can be made for a reasonable budget and that we can actually shoot so that we can prove to people that we can tell stories and hopefully take that next step as storytellers, not just people who are, you know, auditioning for jobs. How about you, Steven? Um, well, I think I, I, it's, I feel like it was always somewhere. Um, yeah, it was something in the back of my mind, knowing that, you know, in, in this industry, especially just with the technology these days, what it affords you, um, you better be able to figure out stuff on your own. Cause, um, you know, I, I just, I know that where I stand in this industry and I was not, you know, God's gift to the entertainment industry as an actor. Um, and so I knew to do certain things that I wanted to do, you know, you're going to have to create those opportunities for yourself. And, um, so I, I you know, it's, it's just kind of been a steady, um, evolution of, of, you know, trying different things, you know, realizing I had all my eggs in that in the acting basket when I was in my twenties, um, and realizing that the opportunities that were coming to me, um, were, were kind of out of my control. You know, you go audition for things and some things you really, really want. And it's almost like the more you want something, the more you want up not getting it. And then a job that you're like, eh, I really don't care if I get this job. And it's like, Hey, you booked it, you know, <laughs> you gotta, you know, I gotta go take it cause I need a job. So I, I think that, um, you know, to, to really, as I got a little bit older, um, and a little more, yeah, a, a little more edgy about the business and realize, all right, um, if, if you know what I want to do, I'm going to have to, you know, take the bull by the horns and try to figure out how to do it on my own because, you know, um, that's not going to all just line up with landing the perfect audition at the best time and, and booking it. And then off you go, you know, it's just not, <laughs> that does not happen every day or, you know, uh, likely at all. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, yeah, I think from there, you know, it's, it's, it's been an evolution of certain projects that, you know, haven't gone very far and, and just, you know, whether it be a little bit of writing, a little bit of producing, but, you know, kind of learning something, uh, from each thing. And then, um, you know, with this one, with everyone is doing great, kind of felt like all the pieces started to, you know, fall into place where, okay, it could take, you know, what I've learned, um, up to this point and, and trying to get stuff made and, and go out there. Um, also to say, you know, partner up with somebody, you know, realize that I can't do stuff, you know, on my own. And, and, you, you know, you got to get good people around you to help you, um, you know, you know, fill in your weaknesses and, and, uh, mm -hmm. and get, you know, get things made. So how did you guys come up with everyone is doing great? Yeah, it was, um, it was, uh, sort of out of necessity, I guess. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. you know, I think we had, we had lived enough life coming out of One Tree Hill to realize um, that we had lived a pretty absurd life in our 20s. Um, and to have that amount of success um, <laughs> at such a young age is completely, it's absurd. It's, mm -hmm. it's insane what, what, what happened. And we were insanely fortunate. Um, and then to have, you know, some, some years that weren't so successful, you know, to really humble you and to make you look back and go, okay, I see a sort of like arc forming here where, you know, we had a late coming of age, you know, and, and we had a late coming of age in this really crazy industry where hilarious things are happening all around us. And there's, um, you know, extraordinary, extraordinary things happening all around us that really make for great comedy. Um, you know, and you know, we've never, we've never felt sorry for ourselves throughout this whole process of, you know, um, auditioning and rejection and all of this stuff. Like, 
I think, you know, we've always found the narrative that it's, you know, a really tough thing to do a little bit tiresome because it's what we chose to do, right? Like nobody's going to feel sorry for you because you just keep coming back for more and you know, you're always going to come back for more. So really for <laughs> us, the, the catharsis in all this was just to laugh at it. to so get together and to share our stories and to be like, you're never going to believe what happened at this audition today. Like you're never going to believe what I saw this party or this person that I met or, um, and, uh, and and just laugh at these things and you know this is something that we really wanted to bring to a show that that lined up with our comedic sensibilities right like we knew that we wanted to make a show um that was up to the standards of the shows that we love to watch mm -hmm. uh, we love shows like fleabag you know catastrophe we love this the trip with steve coogan and rob Brydon. like um we love uh we'll let the show on hbo doll and m things that are feel really naturalistic and feel really dry and um mind the humor a lot of out of a lot of like awkward and cringy moments um, mm -hmm. instead of punchlines um and we 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 just felt like we were like living in this world where all of a sudden we could see we could see this happening around us we were sort of observing it and um so we decided to sort of i guess take that and um and try to create some characters that we could map onto these things um and onto this world and into these situations um, and create a story around it that would also line up with our storytelling sensibilities, which is really we gravitate to stories about, you know, friends, families and, you know, families basically that are full of people that are just there. They probably shouldn't be friends, but mm. they have this shared experience or they have this shared past where they're sort of forced to continue to deal with each other. Mm -hmm. um, and whether or not they stick together is based on whether or not they love each other. Right. Like right, those right. are the stories that we're on to. So. It was just all these things, a sort of confluence of things that came together to at this time to make us realize that we might have, you know, a story to tell here through everyone's doing great. Now, Stephen, did um, did your agents and managers and your friends around you say you guys are absolutely nuts? This is not going to work. No one's ever, you know, done an independent show before and sold it <laughs> anything major before. I mean, did that happen? <laughs> you know, I got kind of the. Um status quo from the the reps where it was like oh that's that's really nice oh that's sweet you know they're like okay and, and oh, you go I do mean, your little you're still gonna be auditioning right like <laughs> we should still be sending you stuff and i'm like yeah yeah no of course but please, please do um they're like okay all right just making sure but I, you know i think that they, they hear that and, and the expectation um on their end is like oh man if i had a nickel for every time i heard a client talk about something that they're making on their own and <laughs> never seeing the light of day <laughs> Uh, I, and even myself, they'd probably have a few nickels for me because I definitely have done it before right. um, as, you know, try to shake them down to help you, you know, get some traction on a script or like get something, yeah. you know, get them to read something that you wrote. Um, so there, you know, there was that kind of like, you know, yeah, they're just playing along. Um, but I, I think at, at Friends, it was, um, you know, there was we had some good support from friends that were rooting us on. Like, you know, I think people in the industry were like, fuck, yeah, man, like go do it, you know? And I think that it also, you know, with the community of, of people that got around our show when we were crowdfunding, I mean, that really helped lift us up and, and continue, um, have us continue to move forward on it was that, you know, people were on board and excited. They heard about the concept. They would just be looking at a log line and, and being like, you know what, that seems interesting. I, I'd be into that. And they're like, yeah, like I want to contribute to the show. Um, go on and do it. So I, I think it was, you know, for the most part, it, uh, it was positive feedback and, and to have like our, our communities of, of family and friends um, saying, you know, go for it um, is is really cool and, and, and definitely helped propel us to the finish line. So I, I find it fascinating when you said that the agents played along because I actually, you know, earlier in my career, I, was, I had a full films and I got a star attached and it was, it was a t you know, she'd done TV and she had done a few movies and things like that. And we go in. And what you're saying is exactly what the agents would do. They came in, they did the show, they sat around the the, the, the conference table and like, okay, so, you know, oh yeah, we can go out to this person and yeah, we might know this person to try to kind of play along. And I was so green. I'm like, oh my God, we're going to get this movie made. This is amazing. <laughs> and then, you know, nothing ever panned out, but they needed to play along to keep the client happy. So I'm so like, I didn't know that was a thing. And when you just said it, I'm like, that makes all the sense in the world because I've been in that room when <laughs> we're like, oh, yeah, because she's the producer on this and she wants to put this all together. I was like, no, wo no wonder nothing ever came of it, you know? Unless, of course. You know, it's, it's like they don't they know the, the road and 
It's you tough. Know, it's I, tough. I get it. If they don't have the time for that, and they're like, look, this is a bottom line game I'm here with my clients for. <laughs> like, you know, like I know if this person's getting started on a project, like this film is not going to be made next month in six months. And wow, if they make it in a year, that's incredible. So they're like, I don't, I don't have time for something that's two years out. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, we need to get, we need to get paid need now. now. I need you know, my 10%. I, get it. I, get I need it. my 10%. I need my 10%. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm staring at 10% in 2024. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Good luck, buddy. Good, good luck. Yeah, good, <laughs> exactly. Good luck to you, my friend. But you're still going to go out. We can still send you out, right? We can send now. We can still send you out. Yeah. I love that because like, we, we still need to make our money off of you right now. So it's it's fascinating. They're going to be supportive 100%. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's Being good. supportive just, just means like, you know, saying like, yeah, sure, we'll help. I'll call, like, I'll call, I'll call Will Smith. I'll call. And then we'll step in later. <laughs> yeah. we If you bring in $5 million, we can get the rest. <laughs> we, we are game. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, you bring five million yeah. and Will Smith to the table. We can get you uh, <laughs> the rest of it. Yeah. No problem. No problem. Yeah. yeah, that's that's the way the game is played. Um, so all right, so guys, how did you um put this? Is this self financed? I mean, because it doesn't look like it's like a you know, it's not Game of Thrones for for sure. So I'm assuming the budget was you know indie. But how did you guys raise the budget? Yeah, well, it was um. It was, I guess it was a, a, a sort of a tiered process, sort of just like the entire process was, um, you know, we, we didn't know that we were going to shoot our entire season independently. Uh, we started off with, um, a pilot uh, right. and the pilot was self-financed and very naively, we thought that we would, um, execute this pilot and, um, the it money, would be the money, and the then money take would it just out come and in. We would sell it. And then somebody <laughs> would be like, oh yeah, we want this to be a, you know, Hulu original or whatever. Uh, yeah, that didn't happen. Uh, it didn't happen for a lot of reasons. Uh, you know, first of all, I think um, the pilot that we made was the pilot that we wanted to make, and we were really, really proud of it. But it was 2017, and um, you know, a lot of the streamers that exist now didn't even exist back then, and a lot of the you know bigger ones now were just sort of booting up, um, and you know, their different departments and just sort of really defining what kind of th things they wanted to do. Um, and we just didn't anticipate the challenges of, of shopping around an independent TV show. Uh, we didn't realize just how kind of, I guess, unprecedented it was. It Insane. was just not something that happened. There was no yeah. template for selling it, right? right. Um, further than that, we didn't know uh, that we even needed a sales agent, really. We didn't know the sales agent game, right? We were having our talent reps reach out to development people at these companies um, and seeing if like, you know, they would get, you know, if, if they could push the ball forward, um, we weren't even, we weren't considering the acquisitions departments and things like that. Um, you know, we'll talk about this later about, you know, we, we didn't actually know how, how sort of nebulous that world was as well. And how many gatekeepers that there were and how relationship based it is. So we just didn't have any of these relationships or any of these connections. So, um, once we realized we weren't going to sell the pilot um, and that if we were going to produce the rest of the season, episodes two through eight, through eight we were going to have to do it independently. Um, we were uh, we, we had always considered the crowdfunding route, but um, we didn't know for sure if we wanted to take that plunge. It was our last it was really our last sort of final option because we had heard that it's going to be the hardest thing you ever do. Um, <laughs> yes, I've done it. It's so horrible. We like, yeah. And you know, the Nelms brothers um, who you had on in the past, like they, they did it as well. And I watched them do it and I watched them break their backs for, for the money that they made for post on, on their first movie or one of their first movies. And um, you know, they were, they were encouraging us to do this as well. Like the Nelms brothers had our backs on the crowdfunding front. They were like, you should do this because it's going to help you retain creative control, whatever money you can raise of, of your budget. It's going to help you, uh, maintain that leverage um, and, and that control over the project for for its life. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I guess you know, once we had exhausted all options, we we took that plunge, that crowdfunding plunge. Um, crowdfunded for how many days, Stephen? Forty five days. Mm, um, yeah, at least forty five. No, ju all ju June, July, and then we extended a little bit into August. So it, it would have been up to about three months. And what platform did you guys use? Kickstarter, Indiegogo. Indiegogo. Great. And how much did you guys raise? We wound up raising about uh, 270K. And that's, then um, after, that's awesome. Yeah. After fees and um, uh, we had to take some money for, of course, for the perks and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. We were able to 
to use about at least 200, uh, 210, 215 into our budget. Um, and then we had to bridge the gap a little bit to get to where we could, you know, still have enough to finish the season. That's amazing. But that's a, that, that's a success, man. Like you pull in over a quarter million on a, on a platform for a, a television se- or a streaming series. That's a pretty, that's a pretty good goal. I guess you tapped into a lot of your fans and, and things like that to, to, to help with that. I'm assuming. Yeah, no, I know. Oh, and for, for sure. For us, yeah. To have people, you know, um, contribute for, a, a, you know, a show they haven't seen before, you know, this was, not the uh, reunion uh, or the sequel <laughs> of something. So, right, you know, right. people were having to take a leap of faith for us. Um, and, you know, th- I think that was that, you know, we struggled a little bit out the gate um, trying to get people a- a- on board for this. But it was, you know, ultimately it, it was that community behind, um, you know, One Tree Hill uh, that, you know, um, got got involved and, and and wanted to see us, you know, where we wanted to support us in whatever our next uh, venture was, because they knew that maybe, you know, the reunion wasn't going to be happening anytime soon. So, um, yeah, incredible community of fans. there, been very loyal and, and we're very grateful for that because without them, this doesn't happen. And it ultimately was, you know, about two weeks in, we're like, we need some sort of kick. You know, we really need something to, to boost um the finances there, or at least, you know, the money coming in for, um, for the Indiegogo project. And, and we, we came up with the idea of, of doing some live watches where we would, uh, invite some cast members from the show, from, uh, our old show, Winter Hill and, and watch an episode. And, um, you know, it offered us a great opportunity for us to, you know, see some of our cast members that we hadn't seen for a while and kind of to fill a little bit of that, that, want for you know what the fans are looking for is they're trying to hear the news on whether or not the show's going to have a reunion or whatnot it's mm-hmm. like well they just want to see some of these people back together and um you know to get, get you know four or five of us sitting in a room chatting about the show it was um you know a, a, an experience that the fans really enjoyed and and they came back you know four or five times as we did a few of them and it wound up just being you know um the, the, the most lucrative thing for us in our project you know, yeah raising up yeah i mean you leverage what you have so you know if you've got a fan base in, and i'm assuming how did you get to that fan base i mean did you just hit the facebook groups i mean i, I don't think you have an email list with a bunch of one tree hill fans so like how mm-hmm. did you how did you reach out to these these communities and and get them to to watch and to contribute yeah our, our followings on social media were a huge part of it um uh, I mean, pretty much everybody that follows me is is a One Tree Hill fan, unless they're my mom or my friend. Um, so, <laughs> so you know that was that was um, that was really important is being able to connect with people through social media. Um, that was what brought in you know our, I think our first wave of people. But I think another really important thing was that we were able to show um, these people that that ju- you know this first wave of people that we have a product. Um, that you're going to like, right? Because the challenge with an arts project is that you can't really show them the content of the arts project, right? You can't really like have virtual screenings for people of the movie you're trying to make. Um, fortunately, we were making a TV show and we had shot a pilot. And we were able to take this pilot around to some festivals um, uh, that were really, really great. Like ATX Festival is a television festival in Austin that um, showcases all kinds of television. Um, and, you know, they, they, they showcase a few independent pilots every year. They chose us for one of theirs. Um, Series Fest is an all independent television uh, festival that they hold in Denver, Colorado. Um, at the time, New York Television Festival was one. Um, so there was just there's a bunch of different festivals that we were able to hit and we were able to invite fans out, you know, people that knew about us from One Tree Hill, invite them to these screenings, um, talk to them after these screenings, meet them after these screenings and get their first of all, creatively get their feedback. Right. See if it, the show was actually funny to them. But then also they were able to see the first episode of the show and then, you know, tell other people on our Instagram feeds or on our Twitter feeds or, you know, on the message board on Indiegogo, like, yes, this is a good show. You will like this show. You know, there's there's something here. Um, So I think that that was a huge, huge asset to us being able to take out that sort of, you know, if if this wasn't a TV show, you'd call it like a proof of concept. Right. Mm -hmm, But it mm -hmm. was a TV show as a pilot. And it just, it just, um, the timing of that taking out for those festivals, we, we, in hindsight, we realized just how incredibly, um, you know, valuable that was for us. And how many days did you shoot? Um, like how many total days? I mean, assuming you just sat and did just, just shot it all out in a, in a, in a row, right? So how many days did you shoot eight episodes and, and it, each episode's what, 30 minutes, less than that? Approximately 30. Yeah. We, we got, um, 
we got anywhere from 25 to 37 minutes. Mm -hmm. Um, so thankful for the streaming services to be flexible on those <laughs> run times. Um, exactly. So we didn't have, a, have to kill as many babies as, as we expected. Uh, but, um, yeah, we wound up shooting over the course of about 35 days, uh, eight episodes. That's a lot. And yeah, obviously block shooting everything, getting locations wrapped up and was, was you know, key. Michelle Lang, who... Um, that was seven worked... episodes, right, that we shot? Because we had already shot the pilot the year before. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And then we shot seven episodes, the seven additional episodes over that 35 day period, the year Eight after. Minus one is seven. That is confirmed. Right. <laughs> this is why we make a great team. Uh, so we, yeah. And uh, Michelle Lang, who um, works with the Nelms brothers, uh, um, she's married to Ian there. They, she, you know, was so clutch in, in getting our schedule all dialed up and, and, and making sure that, you know, we're maximizing our locations. Um, and it was fluid too. That schedule was changing constantly. I mean, she did a good job of matching, mapping it out in the beginning. And we kind of had an idea of where we were going to be for those next 35 days, uh, from the jump, of course. But, um, you know, she was always kind of looking to adjust it. Where can we make, where can we save a buck? Um, and, you know, having somebody like that on, um, our team, just, you know, thinking about things that we are not even anywhere on this in the same universe of thinking about, um, with that scheduling and how we can save some money. Because especially when we're, we're doing our shoestring budget, um, w was key. So, um, w it was, it was hectic, but we, uh, we got it done. And, you know, Michelle Lang was a big part of that. So you guys, uh, I mean, you guys have been on, uh, you know, on sets pretty much all, almost all your life at this point. You were like, really were on sets for a long time. Uh, and a couple, and you've directed a few, you know, a few episodes here and there. Uh, how much did that play in, in the success of what you guys were doing? I mean, cause obviously you knew what a, professional quote unquote set was, but you knew that one tree hill set is definitely not going to be the, all the bells and whistles that you're going to be using on this show. So how was that transition? Mm -hmm. Cause you know, you're used to being on, I've been on network sets. They're, they're nice. They're plush. The crafty, the crafty is fantastic. Lunch is, you know, lobster. Uh, you know, it's really, it's really a nice scenario depending on the budget of the show, but generally speaking, network shows uh, are really nice. So how was that transition from, Hey, I, I need something. Oh, we have a department for that too. We need something. Figure it out. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's a really good question because I think there are things that we, that we learned, you know, from being on larger sets that helped us. And there were also things that totally blindsided us as well. Right. Um, you know, there was, <laughs> I think that the general concept of time management really sinks in when you uh, work in television, uh, you know, on whatever budget you are, you're working on, like, you know, working on uh, whatever, whatever network TV show, you're still trying to shoot an ungodly amount of pages a day, no matter what, there's not enough time. You're, you never have enough days to get the show to get the episode that you want to shoot. And as an actor, you sit around and you just watch people like run around like their hair's on fire, trying to make this impossible thing possible. So and you learn about time management really well because you're always watching your clock, right? And so I think that's one thing that we were able to carry into to everyone is doing great is is clock management, right? Is that time management is is making sure that um, you know we have contingency plans that we have um, this space in our schedule to shoot things that we might have missed or that we're able to adapt if you know we didn't get this one thing at this location, what other location can we put it at? We had seen enough of this. Um, sort of sleight of hand be played, you know, throughout our careers to be able to employ it ourselves. And obviously with the help of our pro producing team, but then also there's nothing that can compare you to, you know, or that can prepare you to, uh, for the, um, you know, first week of our shooting in Steven's actual apartment. And, you know, the fact that there's going to be 35 crew in a two bedroom <laughs> apartment, um, you know, wearing their work boots. And I'm assuming, you know, did you get permit? Did you get permission? Or, did, or, or yep. you gorilla? Oh, you did get permission. You didn't gorilla. Yeah, yeah but you know, we, we <laughs> you stretched we got it. permission for a couple of people. <laughs> yeah, just for like two days. <laughs> Not necessarily. We won't say how many people were there, and we won't say for how many days. But it didn't really work out to that. What I had quoted. <laughs> I mean, and you know, you gotta like hand it to Stephen, who is you know, this is his apartment. He's producing, writing the show. He's directing one of the episodes that we're shooting at that location. And he's got to be thinking about all these different things. 
And he's also thinking about the fact that like this person today didn't wear soft, sho- soft soled shoes. Yep. So like we might get kicked out. You know what I mean? Um, or he's worried about, you know, getting Starbucks gift cards to all of his neighbors and making sure that they got them so that we've got, you know, we're in the good graces of the building. Um, you know, it's not a, it's not a completely conducive mindset to, uh, creativity and nothing, you know, can really prepare you for that. Nothing in our experiences on, on I, mean, I got PTSD right now, seriously. You're like, you're, so, you're starting to, you're, you're starting to, tw- I can see the twitching. I can see the twitching I happening. Know, I don't know how we, uh, I don't know how we got through those, those days. Um, but yeah, I mean, I got sick in the middle of it as well. Oh yeah. And, uh, anytime an Apple box was just scraping across the floor, I, 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 I mentally murdered that individual and then carried on with my scene i'll I'll tell you what man like i've shot so much in my own places during my career like at my own house like my first my first like fifty thousand dollars i spent on my commercial demo reel back when i was doing commercials which i shot on 35 and all that i did it in my house i had like two two full shoots in my house like doing different areas like in my living room i'd set up a a set and i like because i had to And Mm -hmm. that exact thing, someone like a grip would just drag something along and you're just like trying to direct it. And then you have the money. So this is basically exactly the only thing that you did that I didn't do is I didn't act in it. Thank God. So I'm doing everything. I'm doing everything else. But I feel you, man. Like you, you, that Apple box gets dragged. Oh, God. Oh, I know. know. We had (laughs) it's brutal. And I had this this deck that was was great because, you know, people can go have lunch out there and, and we can store gear out there. Um, and, but you know, we fired up, uh, breakfast there at like six fifteen in the morning. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh my God. How did we get away with it? I, like, I, Starbucks, I, I, Starbucks yeah. cards go a long way. <laughs> they really yeah. Do. yeah. They, they they really thankfully, do. you know, there was some supportive people, some supportive neighbors, but then there wasn't some supportive neighbors and <laughs> there was, we did get a noise complaint. Like on the first day, you know, there was a, the manager who I'd spoke to hadn't talked to somebody else. And so they showed up and they were like, uh, what are you doing? <laughs> and I was like, you know, I talked to blah, blah, blah. They're like, oh, okay. All right, right on. Um, but at first they were, I thought, you know, they had come to basically shut us down. So yeah, man, it's, um, <laughs> Coming I, for- it's still, yeah. I, once, oh, the, thank God that, that was, <laughs> Can well, you see how much stress that, this after is five days, He's stressed out. He is stressing out. It's over, bro. Bro, it's over. It's over. It's it felt, okay. It honestly felt like a mistake because <laughs> after all of this buildup to get to this point of wanting to shoot the show and it's our own and we're so excited and we got our uh-huh. first couple days of shooting and then all of a sudden it's just back-to-back days like in, in my apartment um, with one thing after another and I couldn't, you know w- – w- once we got to the finish line and and we were like halfway through that last day there and I'm like, okay, we got it now. I know we're going to get through this location. The shoot started for me, but I couldn't mm-hmm. tell you what happened on any of the scenes in my character's apartment because um, <laughs> I, my brain was just ping ponging off the walls. And that's the thing. I mean, for, for filmmakers listening now, man, until you're in the, in, in, until you're in the weeds or as they used to say, like when you're in war, when you're in the shit. You really, really feel it because, man, it's a thousand things going on at the same time. You've got money dealing with. You've got your act. You, you were acting, which is insanity to me. Like I can't even begin to begin to try to think about acting in a scene while doing all this stuff. Uh, it's it's brutal, man. But I, I think this is a comment that no one's ever. This is a sentence that's ne- never been uttered in Hollywood. All I have is too much time and too much money to make this project. Like that. <laughs> that's never been uttered. In yeah, Hollywood seriously. since the days of fucking Edison. <laughs> like yeah, not, like no. no no one has ever said that. Absolutely not. You know, it's it's insane. So you got another week, you sure you don't want to use it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean yeah, I'm good. Do you want another month? I mean, we could just do another month if you want. Like never yeah. you've never you never hear that. It's it's insane. <laughs> I mean you I go get, to Panama and get that shot on the beach. <laughs> you don't want it? Okay. You don't want it? That's fine. We'll just green screen it. That's fine. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I can imagine the culture shock for you guys as being, you know, regular actors on a hit show and never having to think about any of that. Like even when you were directing on the show, you still never had to think about that. You were just directing a show and it's all your family and friends are around. You know, you've been with these people forever. You don't think about all that other stuff, really. I mean, you time management, yeah. But when everything's on your shoulders... I, I got to believe that the culture shock must have been what, at what moment did that hit you guys? Like, was it day one when you said, 
on the on day one on the pilot even like did you just go oh we're not in kansas anymore like when when was that i mean i'm sure someone told you and it's like it's, it's like having kids someone could tell you you're gonna have kids but and, and oh it's gonna be bad you're gonna lose sleep until you have a kid you have no idea it's like right in your face so it, when was that moment yeah. for you guys i think for me it was when we were at steven's apartment and um <laughs> I don't know. This is probably the first time we've ever told this story. We might get crucified by our producers, but I just think it's too interesting. <laughs> we'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Um, you know, we had, at, at, when we started shooting, um, we had about two thirds of our budget. And we had a contingency plan in place. Like we were starting at Steven's apartment. We we're going to shoot all this contained stuff. We knew that we could shoot a version of our season for two thirds of the budget, right? We would just have to change a lot once we left Steven's apartment. Um, and, and we were still waiting to see if a financier was going to come on to cover that, that final third. And we were getting to the point, I was probably like four or five days in when it was really like a breaking point. And Michelle Lang had to come to set and like sit me and Steven down and sit Ian Anesh down and Johnny Durango, our other executive producer. And you know that like that we're like the rest of the crew setting up a shot over at Steven's apartment, and we are like down the hall and sort of around the corner in like a little outdoor lounge. We can see across the the gap to Steven's apartment, and it was nighttime. And Michelle's walking us through the fact that um, we might not get this money, and that it could change a lot, and but that everything's going to be okay. And I remember just having like a bit of like an out of body experience where I just sort of like. I just sort of went numb and I just sort of left like I was sort of seeing the world from behind my eyes. And I was like, oh, this is it. This is what they talk about. <laughs> this is, I'm dying. This is I'm dying. I'm dying. When I'm... It all means too much and <laughs> it's all on you. And um, yeah, something either really, really um, miraculous is going to happen or, or this is going to be a horror story. You know what I mean? It's like this is the moment that it hinges on. And thankfully, something miraculous happened um, in that particular scenario. But that was a real... Yeah, that was a real moment for me. It was it was like oh, a, yeah. it, you guys had a coming to Jesus conversation, like come to Jesus conversation is basically it sat you down oh, yeah. like it's like this guy's look. It's this is and I've had by the way, I've had those conversations with my first AD on projects or my UPM on early 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 projects so like look man, I know you've got 752 shots you want to do in 4 hours. I understand that. But this is the reality. You got 4 shots. Let's do this. <laughs> you yeah. know. Yeah. Yep. So you were going to say, Steve? Uh, I was just going to say, um, you know, yeah, I think in, in, I feel like, you know, James and I, have, we've had this like, you know, go get them attitude. So it was like, there's nothing that we can't handle. Like we could, we could, we'll figure it out. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll figure out how we'll do this. Like, we're just not going to take no for an answer, blah, blah, blah. Like just learn on the fly. That's why I like working with James. Like he's resourceful. He gets it. He just shuts up and does the work, you know? And, you know, there was definitely times where like, oh, you know what, we, we've, it's not necessarily we've taken on too much. It's like, you just can't do this. Like this isn't, there are people that have gone to school for this or have trained to do this for a while. <laughs> and some of the tasks, like we just took for granted, like, for example, locations, like I was doing locations for a while and um, <laughs> then we got closer to shooting and it was like, all right, there's still a lot of locations that need to be actually locked. And then it was like, well, those are kind of in the second half. So we'll start shooting. And now we're shooting and there's some locations in the back half that we're still trying to lock. And I'm trying to, and we're trying to negotiate like at every single location, it was not taking their, you know, their, their first offer, letting them know, like telling them the story, you know, we're, we're crowdfunded, we're shoe, shoe, shoe budget over here. So like, please like, you know, uh, what, what can you do to help us out? And it just, there was, you know, you're just juggling those. And, and we, we actually had in the middle of the shoot to bring somebody on and say, okay, this person's going to just handle locations, like <laughs> stop worrying about it. See if you tried, <laughs> you know, you yeah. got some good stuff, but like, it's starting to, you know, it distract you from other things. So, yeah. um, you can't be driving from Northridge down to, uh, down to Downey every day. We're, we're <laughs> like trying to, we're like putting the finishing touches on the script. It's just not, yeah. not and that's and that's one of the biggest mistake first time filmmakers in the indie space do is they'd like oh I can do all of this or I could do this I could do yeah. that and they take so much on that you get nothing done you have yeah. to bring you have to bring people and you have to have help in one way shape or form um, and sometimes it's it's uh, educated help 
sometimes it's an uneducated help. Like, you know, you get, yeah. your, bro you get yeah. your brother, your buddy who wants to be in the business. Like, look, do location scouts. Sometimes it works out great. Sometimes not so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you know, I think the, the line is blurred these days as well with, you know, what you can learn and what you can't execute. Right. Mm -hmm, like you mm -hmm. can learn, a, you can learn a lot. Like, and this is, this has been a blessing for us. You know, the fact that technology has come so far, the fact that our access to information is just so exponentially better than it was even 10 years ago. Um, you know, but it also, it gives you this false sense of security. It gives you this, um, you know, false sense of capability, really, I think, um, you know, we, we did learn to do a lot. Um, and we did, we, we were, especially in post-production, right. Once we got into the editing process, um, we were able to save ourselves a lot of coin just by doing things ourselves and learning to do things by ourselves. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, um, we had to, we had to recognize where we had to draw the line. We're like, you know, okay, we can, we can keep banging our heads against a wall with this thing that we just learned to do on YouTube three days ago, or we can <laughs> sort of, you know, reach a point where we realize, oh, this is what they pay people big bucks for. Okay. Let's go find someone who knows what they're doing. Right. Before we, you know, you know, carve up our project uh, more than we need to here, or, you know, do something, you know, make some sort of fatal mistake right so you guys didn't uh shoot your own movie you you weren't the dps as well <laughs> we did not, not soderberg it no you didn't yeah. so, you didn't soderberg. dude i found out i i honestly within like a couple years ago i found out that soderberg was his own dp and he'd always been his own dp i had no idea because he changes his name on the credits yeah. i didn't know that yeah. I, all of his and then you go back you know like he did oceans 11 and che and I mean, Aaron Brockovich wow. and all like he, oh, he was, the D, it's what well, you start thinking about it. And you're like, and he was the writer and he was like, he's a freak of nature. He's like an absolute wow. freak of nature to do all of that. Yeah. Very, very few, very few guys can do that. And trust yeah, me, I, yeah. my, my first feature, I was the DP on and mind you, I was already 20 years in and I, and I, I've been a colorist for 10 years. So I'm like, you know what? Let me just get it down the line. If I just did it down the middle expose it i'll fix it in post which is exactly what yeah. i did but after mm -hmm. after that i was like never again never ever <laughs> ever oh, again God. it's too much man it's too it's too yeah. much it's it takes a special brain to do all of that stuff um you know what? Uh, good i was just gonna say another thing we learned like real quick was i think it was important to take um being able to understand like a pulse of your set and it, that oh. i felt like I recognized um, as I'm sitting around on a set waiting for, you know, to act on, on, on certain acts, just the, you know, how, how quickly like a dynamic can change. It's almost like people are, and especially in these long days, like people can get, um, you know, they get edgy and naturally I, I totally understand it. And so it doesn't take much to set people off. And so to kind of, you know, uh, be a little more aware of, of, you know, the treatment of people, especially, and for us, when, you know, there's no room to go anywhere, we were crammed in an apartment or we're crammed in whatever location, um, you know, all on top of each other that, um, you know, to try to, you know, respect people for the jobs that they're doing, give the attaboys and, and um, you know, also, I guess, still try to provide some decent food because, you know, our crew, <laughs> like, they, uh, you know, we had them, there's no comfort for them whatsoever. Um, wow. And they're working completely full days. And. Um, you know, I think M Michelle Lang was, was key in saying, well, we're going to, we're going to pay for a decent caterer. You know, we got to get some, we got to get them fed well. Um, but, um, you know, just, uh, trying to, I don't know, just check in with, with crew and, and, and have like, uh, you know, you create a, a cordial relationship with everybody. Um, and I think that also helps at the end of the day when, you know, the going gets tough and, and people either want to get the F out of there, which I understand, or just so sick of like this Lack, like we're missing a couple resources and you're having to wear an extra hat that you're not necessarily getting paid for but like you know what they're going to step up because they believe in the people that are running this project I, I think that that helped us a lot and and you know we also had young um we had a lot of young filmmakers people that are just getting started in the business and that was really crucial because while they're not getting paid you know big money they're ready to hustle you know they're ready to um you know to to be on a set and, and make a film project, you know? So, um, that was, you know, something that was also very vital to, you know, fill in the blanks of not having a comfortable set that you would get on a major network. Yeah. Did you and guys, that's something that we learned? Oh, oh sorry. I was, no, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say, um, that's something that we learned from the Nellens brothers as well. Um, being on sets with the Nellens brothers, I learned very early on with them that like the reason that their sets are so amazing and people are so happy is because um 
they realize that they're not being asked to do anything that the directors wouldn't do themselves or would, don't have the utmost respect yeah. for, right? Like these are guys that these are not directors that go to the director's trailer in between setups and do whatever the hell they want to do in there. Like these are guys who are there on set every single every single moment. They they love the process. They truly love being there, and that is contagious. And that's what gets people through those long days and those long nights is is knowing that the person at the top still really cares about this and really cares about you know really wants everybody else to care um and is 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 willing to put in the work just like they are um i I just yeah i mean we learned that from that from them very early on and just we try to be those guys on set every day we'll be right back after a word from our sponsor and now back to the show now did you guys uh happen to feed your crew spinning wheels of death Do (laughs) do you know what those are what is that so no. This is an old. This is an old, this is the best stuff ever comes from uh, old DPs. Um, so a buddy of mine who's a, like he's been in the business 40, 50 years, and he was DPing something I was directing, and it was a low budget situation. And we talked about lunch, and I said, "Hey, do you guys, you know, maybe we should just get some pizza." He's like, "Do not bring out spinning wheels of death. Do not bring out." He just he goes, "That's what they're called because it just drags the crew." cheese and bread and it just <laughs> slows everyone down he goes don't do it don't do it and he also and he also always used to say every time he couldn't get something the way he wanted to he's like i'm surrounded by assassins I'm surrounded by assassins <laughs> everywhere i look surrounded by assassins and i use that line constantly on a set like surrounded by assassins god damn it but did you did, did, did you do the pizza thing at one point <laughs> we actually didn't do pizza good we, uh, you see I guess That's a good know. producer. Yeah, good producer. Shout out, was it Spartan Catering, James? Spartan Brothers. Yeah. Spartan, yeah, they were they were solid. They they had, they had good food and and um, you know, we tried to make really sure yeah, food. you know, have the other options for um, you know, people with with allergies or whatever, and and just made sure we we're on top of that. Or or you know, there was a couple days where they might have forgotten, or maybe those first days, you know, working through the kinks that there weren't enough of those meals. It was like let's go, you know, let's get this fixed right now, you know. Um, and other than that, we kept them well caffeinated. That's for sure. Um, this, this, this started, well, I, you know, myself, but our DP was, was a caffeine fiend. And so, um, we just made sure we, we, we got the Starbucks runs and the coffee going and, you know, thankfully it was a small enough crew that were like, all right. And this is something that James and I would just handle. We're like, you know what? Just take our card and go. Um, let's get everyone, whoever wants something from just, Starbucks or just whatever. Go, just go. It, yeah. It's the cheapest, yeah. it's the cheapest investment you can make in this film. I'll, 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 sure. I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. I come from Miami originally. So in Miami, um, on sets, there's a little old Cuban man who's, he's, he's hired. It's always a little old Cuban man who walks around about two to three times a day with a tray full of these little thimbles of coffee called cotaditos, which is Cuban coffee. Smart. Little, they're like this big. And you look at like, that can't do anything. And I always used to love, I'm Cuban, so I, I, I was raised with this stuff. So I, I see, you know, people who are not used to Cuban coffee, like, oh, there's just a few of them. That's, that's just so little. And they would chug like four or five of them at once. <laughs> and within 15 minutes, they're just like, just like freaking, they're just freaking out. And I'm like, we, we, and all the, all the people who are used to that coffee, like, look, let's let, let's watch, let's see what happens to that act, that actor. And you just see him just start freaking out, like trying that's to do a scene. Funny. So Cuban coffee, if you can I had ever to manage that earlier. I love that. That's, that sounds efficient. <laughs> <laughs> and there's like he, and there's a little way he does it with the sugar and he like he 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 makes it all foam up it's it's a it's an artistry oh. thing and it just they're little little thimbles man not even shot clot, like thimbles that's how powerful and dense the cuban coffee is the way he makes it yeah awesome. the, the, the car the starbucks runs and it is i think starbucks you know there's sure people that will shit on the coffee naturally because it's not that great but there's still a lot of people that are like, oh, oh God, it's, a, it's a dessert couple, to them, right? A couple people. So yeah. <laughs> you get that coffee run dialed up for right after lunch. And um, yeah, you know, it's it's a little gift. That gift goes a long way. Mm-hmm. Um, those those any time that the crew was feeling down, it was like, all right, let's on the double with, with the um, the Starbucks runs. And, and then when someone would show up with them, you know, everyone perked up and it, it was it was and, uh, I don't know. it was as much for us as it was for anybody else. <laughs> Too. I mean, we needed it. You gotta keep, yeah. You gotta keep, you gotta keep the, the ball rolling. I mean, look, if you don't have money to pay them their normal day rates, at minimum, feed them well, and get them coffee. Yes, feed them well totally. and get them coffee. That's, I mean, you could, totally. you could pay them nothing, feed them well, 
Yes. And, and that's at minimum you have to do. And, and that's going to be the best investment you can have in your projects uh, without question. <laughs> so, all right. So you finally get this whole thing together, guys. It's it's finished. It's done. You guys are feeling good about it. And you're like, okay, now what? <laughs> How the hell do you go out? How do you get Hulu's interest in it? And like, you know, I'm sure you hit walls everywhere you went because like this has never happened. No one's ever done this. How did you do it? Yeah, it was a series of unfortunate events followed by one very fortunate event. Um, <laughs> one single very fortunate event. Um, well, let's see. We uh, we finished. We, it took us about eight months to finish the show um, in post to you know get all the episodes to where they needed to be. Um, as we were doing that, we also um, we we got see, uh, sorry we got episode two across the finish line. And then we took episode two out to some of these festivals that had accepted us and, um, you know, our pilot episode. Um, we also use episodes one and two to shop really uh, to take out in a sort of soft way, right? Like to take out to some contacts mm -hmm. um, or some, you know, inroads that we had made. Um, so we continued that festival circuit. We continued to um, take it out a bit. But again, it was the same thing as with um, that pilot episode. We still didn't have a sales agent. We were still going through our talent agents to reach development executives. We were still running into walls and we couldn't get anybody to tell us what to do. Um, you know, we, we, there was no, <clears throat> that whole side of the industry is so relationship based. Um, mm -hmm. And we didn't have the person with the insight or the, or the relationships, or if we could talk to somebody that did have the relationships, we had something that they didn't know what to do with because there was no template for it. They're like, right. you brought me a movie. If this was a movie, it would be one thing. There's a million ways you could go, but this is a TV show and we don't know what to do with this right now. Um, and um, so we got to, I guess we, we finished the show sometime in, um, what it, was it mid mid 2019 Steven something like that or maybe fall of 2019 we started really um, getting to a place where we were happy with the show and felt like it was finished yeah yeah fall. yeah um and we're still taking it out uh we finally realized that this whole sales thing is probably not going to happen for us so we start um getting ready to self distribute uh we were going to go through Amazon uh we were getting our music finished uh we were getting all our contracts in line uh, we were about two weeks away from hitting from hitting um, submit to Amazon's platform. To, for, but uh, so, so so for basically for SVOD and TVOD or just TVOD? Yeah, for for rentals first, I think. Yeah, yeah, to, for, to, for to rent it or buy it. Trans yeah. yeah, transactionals first. So, but you yeah. knew that. I mean, your budget was. I mean, based on the numbers you're saying, your budget was well north of 250. So mm -hmm. to generate that in transactional takes a obscene amount of work. And yeah. luck and magic from the film gods to make that work. So oh, we were planning yeah. on going. We were taking that as we're gonna take the show on the road. Like, there, we're like all right, we're gonna do that. Now we also got to go to what was successful for us and go fill some theaters. You know, like yeah. a tour around, make some stops, and do some appearance kind of stuff just to leverage show yeah. up as much interest right. and, and bring in and some income on that to try to get back our budget. Yeah, we came up with a pretty good game plan for that. You know, um, we did the numbers and it seemed like we could get somewhere close based on, you know, we've done uh, fan conventions before for One Tree Hill. Uh, we knew that there was a certain amount of a built in audience for everyone is doing great itself anyways. Um, you know, we felt good about our, our odds, really. Um, we knew that it would be really, really tough. Um, we knew that it would be basically like crowdfunding all over again. Uh, fun, we fun. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but we just wanted to get the show out there and we didn't know any other way to do it. Um, and so, yeah, that took us to, uh, I think, about January or February of 2020. And then um, my brother, uh, who was a producer on the show as well, uh, his name is Stuart. He just made a random phone call to a friend of his who is a producer who um, has a relationship with Endeavor Content. And mm -hmm. um, so my brother sent this producer our show, our first couple episodes. The producer was like, well, this is interesting. I don't know. Um, by the time he sent it to Endeavor, this agent in Endeavor had taken a look and we were going into lockdown. We were, uh, we, the lockdown wasn't far away. And this agent went, OK, well, this is, you know, interesting. Like he he really to his credit, like he really saw him himself in it in these weird ways. When we finally got on the phone to talk to him, he sort of pitched our show back to us in a way that nobody else really had, which was really cool. Uh, he seemed to just connect with it on, on on one level. But then on another level, he was like, you know, we don't know when people are going to be making stuff again. 
um, there's going to be a real hole in, um, you know, in, in buyer schedules, you know, come, you know, quarter three, quarter four. And, um, and, and this could be a possibility. So um, Endeavor Content took it on. And then uh, there was a list of about 17 different buyers that they were going to go out to with the show. And um, <laughs> over the course of what, three or four months, each of those buyers passed really, really painfully. And slowly and slowly. And slowly, uh, <laughs> and slowly and slowly and painfully. And yeah, we were we were worn down to the point where we were pretty much just like um, you know, going to the park and laying down and staring at the sky, waiting to die. Right. Um, because there was no tour anymore. The tour was shut down. There's no tour, yeah, the there's tour none of that stuff. Down. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh man. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. Now back to the show. And then we got the, yeah, we got the call from Endeavor that said, um, yeah, Hulu wants to, to make an offer. And that, uh, and that, that changed, that changed literally everything. Wow. So it was a sim it was literally the timing, right place, right time, right product. Yeah. A, a year earlier, yeah. maybe not so much a year later, yeah. maybe not so much, but that moment exactly. in time was the time and it's similar to my film like at that moment in time it worked like they would never buy a film like that today uh, so it just happened to be the right timing man that's you know what like like I, I always say to people look luck has a bit to do with this whole thing that we do it, there is luck but the thing is if you hadn't have built that product all the luck and world really wouldn't have helped you <laughs> you needed something yeah. to sell so it just happened to I work out it's kind of like it's a create your own luck scenario, you know, and mm -hmm. there's no, you know, everyone's looking for like the recipe, right? How do you do it? So how did you get your independent show to Hulu, right? Tell us the secret. And but ultimately, there was a lot of hard work that then fell on chance, you know, and fell on a right place, right time opportunity, which you do hear all the time. And I think that the way you get there at the end of the day is, you know, you pay your dues, you work hard, you, you get, you know, you're, you're trying to, you're, you're bringing people in too, you're bringing smart people around you, keep you motivated, keep you pushing where, you're, you know, you're overextending yourself. And I think that's what invites the, the, the opportunity for, for maybe that luck to strike, you know, and it's no guarantee, but this is also what we sign up for. Um, but, you know, um, had we tried to do these buyer screenings that didn't work well had we tried to shake down our reps for months slash years to you know get it to the right people and never feel like we got the right shot um you know had we not done all of that um would we have gone to this gotten to this moment of um right place right time you know i don't think so it just you know there was no shortcuts um so you know you can you yeah. can help your fate i think i like okay. to, i like to believe yeah. you know i, yeah. I believe <laughs> no, there's, there's no, there's no question about it, man. There's absolutely no yeah. question. So when is this? Uh, so you basically sold Hulu for domestic only. So this still has an international opportunity as well for sales. We're going to be uh, in Australia, in the Nordics, and in Latin America, courtesy of uh, Paramount Plus, and their rollout overseas, <laughs> nice. which is which is really really incredible. And another one of those, another one of those things. It's like you know. Oh, man, it's just uh, it's just it's crazy because, you know, we didn't get Hulu. Then our show is never legitimized enough to get on, you know, Paramount Plus oh. for overseas. You know what I mean? It's like this domino effect of, of, of things of things happening. Um, and, you know, obviously it, it shows the power of getting on to, um, you know, a streamer like that. But um, we're just really grateful that we're going to get a reaction from other cultures as well, because, you know, um, we seem to have gotten a really good feedback from our domestic audience. Mm -hmm. uh, people are still finding the show. Most people seem to like it. Um, uh, but you know, comedy is hard <laughs> when you take it, when you export it, mm -hmm. different cultures find different things funny. Um, we were actually really inspired by, um, some Australian comedy, uh, and Australian story storytelling in general, British storytelling. So we feel like it will export nicely there. We hope, um, but we you know non-English speaking countries, it's really impossible for us to tell. And so, yeah, we're kind of waiting on pins and needles to see how it does. And it's, it's going to be really exciting. We got a call from Endeavor actually asking if we wanted to, um, if we wanted to have a say in um, the voices for um, the Latin American market and the Portuguese market for, for <laughs> dubbing. And we both were like, I think we could be hands off with this. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah. this is one we're, we're comfortable delegating. <laughs> it's just like, estoy aquí, por favor. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> 
I, I, I got to brush up on my Portuguese before I, you know. <laughs> no, dude, I used to do, tra I used to do um, translation, not translations, but versioning out for uh, commercials for Latin America. I had to do 30 different versions because every country has their own Spanish. So you you can't right, you yeah. can't send you can't send a Puerto Rican VO guy to Mexico. You can't send a Mexican guy to Argentina. There's such a different in accents, and that's when I discovered that you just can't. It's not one span. You can't send a Spaniard down to Mexico. Like it doesn't it doesn't translate well. It doesn't get accepted well. So that 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 that's going to be a process for you guys down there. Whoever's doing that, which you guys hands off of that, it's going to be an interesting. <laughs> you're making me very glad that we said we'll no stay stay this. away stay, <laughs> stay away out of it. it stay out of that dude just collect the check sir just take the check and catch it <laughs> um that's great man listen it's in this is an inspiring story I, mean, I i know that there's a lot of um actors out there who uh you know have maybe been on shows or has a following and are frustrated just like you guys were with you know having to go and hustle out jobs and, and asking for permission constantly and i'm not saying you're still not doing that obviously because they're not the agents would get very upset so um <laughs> so you're still going out on jobs and stuff but at least you have a little bit more a little bit more control of your own destiny where you're like you know we have a track record now now we can go out and do a, a, maybe a movie or or another series and maybe ha get hired to do be on that side of the fence and now you're building a different level of your career um you know what what advice would you give any actors listening out there right now because i know I'm, i have a few actors who listen as well um about trying to do something similar to what you guys are doing yeah i think um i think I, you know one thing that was easy to forget the more serious the process got for us was that we started this thing as an experiment mm -hmm. um a creative experiment and we agreed with each other that you know if that pilot episode sucked um then nobody would ever see it. And that would be okay. You know, we, we only spent as much money as we were comfortable losing on that pilot. Um, and we went at it experimentally. And I think that gave us the freedom to be creative as creative as we could possibly be to be uninhibited and, you know, and being creative. And it really helped us to just enjoy the process. Um, and that was that was extremely important in finding the tone of this thing and, and, and determining what it really was, um, you know, in shooting it and also, you know, in getting in there in the edit and um, making sure that we just had the time and we were giving ourselves we were giving ourselves the luxury of time to learn and, and taking the pressure off. Right. As much as humanly possible, um, at least with that that first episode. And I would say for, you know, that's the advice that I would give to an actor that's going to go out and make their their first movie is like, look you won't get this right the very first time it, it, it you might get it right but you won't get it as right as you could because you will be learning every step of the way and that's okay that doesn't actually mean that it won't be brilliant like it could be incredible but you're going to see the mistakes in it you know the finished product you will see the mistakes in it so don't worry about getting it exactly right all the way through worry about um setting out to tell the story that you want to tell and and by the end of it, you know, hopefully you will, you will have told it. I think, you know, know the story that you want to tell and also um, make the kind of thing that you would want to watch. And, mm -hmm. and that's all you got to worry. That's all you got to worry about the first time around, you know, surround yourself with people that can worry about the other stuff for you and treat them with respect and pay them well if you can. Um, but at the end, at the end of the day, just, just try to make, just try to make the show or the movie that you would want to watch and, um, and see what happens. And, you know, if you make mistakes, that's okay. You will learn from those mistakes mm -hmm. and you'll get it, you'll, you'll get it right the next time. How about you, Steven? Yeah, I would, I would say, um, you know, check your ego at the door, uh, from the jump, you know, <laughs> it's, it's not, um, you're not the star of the show here. I think anybody who can come on and work for hopefully a decent meal and that Starbucks coffee after lunch is now the star for you. You know, it's, it's, I think, um, getting those people around you that, that are going to be able to, um, you know, help push you with this project, help get it to its finish line and have it, you know, be quality in a way. Um, you know, I, I think that, um, creating those relationships and, um, supporting them where, wherever they need support is, is very vital. So, you know, this isn't about just work on your project here. You know, you offer your ass up to carry gear for them on another project or whatever it is, you know, um, I do that and, and get that experience and, and create those relationships because 
this is not something we're not Steven Soderbergh over here. Um, you're not going to be able to do everything on your own. Um, you need a lot of help. And, and so, you know, people are going to work with people that they you know believe in and that they enjoy working with, especially when the going gets tough, you know? Um, so, um, yeah. And you know. have a really good script supervisor. If you're going <laughs> to be in front of, in front of and behind the camera, Get yes. your ass a really good script supervisor. A, for, a, good, a, good, a good first AD doesn't hurt either. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Definitely doesn't hurt either. <laughs> I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. Uh, I ask all my guests. Um, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show get off your butt and do it that was that was one that took me the longest to learn definitely really um yeah definitely i mean coming from look as an actor you um are very single-minded when you get to set you're and that's the way it should be like you are there to take care of your job um and um and 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 be present for the other people that are in the scene with you um uh, you know, and I worked in, I worked as a director in television as well, which was incredible, which was one of the most like animating and eye opening things that ever happened to me, because that's where I realized just how much of an ecosystem <laughs> every single set is right. Um, and how much uh, every little component depends on the next one. Um, that was a big eye opener for me. And it was a whole level, a whole other level of working hard. And, and, and it was something that I enjoyed. But still, you have that safety net. Still, there is a machine working to help you get everything done. You are not pulling the thing along. You are more right. of a facilitator, right? Um, but yeah, it wasn't until you know working with the Nelms brothers and Michelle Lang and Johnny Durango on their sets, that's when I realized the power um, and the gratification that can come from just getting off your butt and doing something um, you know, yourself, pulling something yourself together yourself, how much you can learn how good um, you can get at what you want to do. Uh, you know, if you want to tell stories the best way to, um, if you want to tell stories this way, I think the best way to become a master at it is to, is to, um, you know, try to pull something together yourself. That's what they, they taught me. Mm -hmm. And it took me a while. To, it took me a while to learn that. I didn't meet them until <laughs> I was like 25. So, <laughs> How about you, Steve? Oh man. Um, yeah, there's, there's a few things I figure out. I'm still getting, uh, <laughs> still, but I, I, I think, um, man, I, it, it's funny. Like I do believe that <laughs> it's tricky that like once it's like staying in your own lane is, is an important thing to, to know like what you can't do. But at the same time with this spirit of this project, it was like trying to do as, and figure out as much as possible. But, um, I think that there was, I, I still need to understand like knowing my my boundaries and and once I know what when I know what those are like just don't try to pretend like you know anything else you know or no further trying to um, you know take on something that you're like oh well I'll just figure it out um, you know I think it's okay to to seek out help or admit that you just don't know how to do something you know I think sometimes we're we're fearful of of you know feeling um, inept at, at whatever you know at, at being able to to finish a job. And so, you know, you, you try to overextend yourself or, or you try to say you got it, but, um, you know, and ultimately you don't, and now you've set things back. So I think it's, it's understanding, you know, my boundaries and <laughs> I feel like I'm still, I'm still trying to figure that out. You know, like, you know, I, I can't say that I can do this when, when I can't, or, you know, I'm, there's not everything I can figure out on my own. Right. Um, so. Yeah. And, and, uh, the toughest question of all three of your favorite films of all time. Oh gosh! <laughs> well, Alex, I listened to your podcast and prepared myself for this because I never had the answers for this. You but son I gotta of a go bitch! With, Thanks for the heads gotta, up, dude. I gotta, yeah, no, I planned. I planned it this way. I got to go with uh, ET. Um, okay. Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Nice. And, nice. Um, and Silver Linings Playbook. Nice. Because I, 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 I feel like I learned something from each one of those films at the time in my life that I watched it. So it was like, you know, when I was a tadpole and then when I was like, <laughs> you know, pubescence and then as an adult. So right. there was something for me in each one of those stages. So, so oh, you God, just... beat that, Stephen. <laughs> Wow. Well, he just left you dangling in the wind there, brother. I'm sorry about that. Well, I'm just going to say, my, we had 
we had like three VHS tapes in my house growing up. Um, and one was like somebody had left a, a, a blockbuster video, um, which was Predator uh, over at our house. <laughs> Obviously one of the greatest uh, action films of all time. Um, and Forrest Gump, which I thought like the scope of that movie was always something that just like stuck in my mind. Um, and the way, yeah, I, the, the way the story's told, the way we go throughout all these different parts of history. And, mm-hmm. and um, that sat with me. I think um, of late, um, well, obviously not of late, but uh, it was actually James' little brother introduced me to True Romance, uh, oh, James, directed yeah. by Tony Scott, and so that good. is a uh, that is a favorite of mine. Dude, I remember walking out because I'm a bit older than you guys, so I remember walking out of the theater watching True Romance, and me and my friends just looked at each other like, "What the hell <laughs> was that?" Like we were just so- in shock. <laughs> That's another movie that another feeling that I had there. I'll give you two other movies that for me going to the movies with like the experience is about um, paranormal activity. Mm. When that movie ended, <laughs> like just the reaction in the theater was amazing. Mm-hmm. And then also uh, Interstellar was another one, which was amazing going into the bathroom afterwards and just getting everyone's reaction. And just like, Oh wow. Like that was like, it's like when, when it's kind of almost hard to step back in society, you know, <laughs> you're like walk out and, and it's not just the glare of being back in the sunlight. It's like, Whoa, like where did I just go? God, I missed that. I <laughs> yeah. miss doing, I miss yeah. going to the theaters, man. I miss going and, and, and getting yeah. that experience. I just saw a picture of Nolan in Burbank. Oh uh, yeah. I saw that. Going, going to, that's the theater I go to. That's exactly, that's the exact theater I yeah. go to. And he's just sitting there with his wife and his friend, just like, yeah. we're going to watch. I, th- I think he was watching the Schneider cut there. I'm not sure what he was watching, but he was watching something there. Um, that's what I was, I was honestly trying to Google that as well. I think he was, I think, I think he was watching Justice League. I think he was Justice League, the four hour cut of that at, at the theater. It's, yeah, man, Nolan is, I mean, Jesus, there's only one of him running around right now in the world, that's for sure. Listen, guys, thank you so much for uh, for being on the show and being uh, an inspiration to a lot of people out there, hopefully listening. And, and maybe they'll pick up their uh, their uh, their 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 chariot to uh, to take it to the finish line um, and try to get something done. So I appreciate that, man. And good luck to you guys. Uh, keep going. I can't wait to see what else you guys do next. Thanks so much, man. Yeah, I appreciate it. Appreciate your podcast, too. Great work. Thank you, man. Thank you, yeah. guys. Thank you, man. Keep hustling. I want to thank James and Stephen for coming on the show and dropping their knowledge bombs on the tribe and also for the inspiration for a lot of filmmakers out there who are trying to get series off the ground or series sold to major streamers. So thank you so much, guys. If you want to get links to anything we spoke about in this episode, head over to the show notes at indiefilmhustle.com forward slash 470. And if you haven't already, head over to filmmakingpodcast.com and leave a good review for the show. It really helps us out a lot. Thank you again so much for listening, guys. As always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. Stay safe out there, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com. 